Thank you. Thank you, Michelle, for that. Um, I think something that stood out to me uh, as you were speaking about, you know, those myths and the importance of use, user research is, you know, the cost impact, right? Like having a great product means ultimately feeds that bottom line. So sometimes when you know, resources are, are tied, we have stakeholders who are hesitant about making that investment into research. So I love to hear your thoughts on um, why that stakeholder is important and what can you do as, as a user researcher to, um, to really gain that stakeholder buy-in? Yeah, stakeholder buy-in is critical. Um, we never want to begin a project without understanding who wants to know the answer to this question set and how will the learnings be applied. And we want to understand that bigger picture in order to make the most informed choices about what we're seeking to uncover, um, who the best people are to gather that feedback from, um, and when, right? So we also want to know when do we need to know these answers in order to impact the roadmap? Do we have like three hours? Do we have three days? Do we have three weeks? Or do we have three months? So understanding that bigger picture is really, really important. And to kind of tie back to what we were talking about um, before the recording started in terms of um, the myth that user research slows down the development process, I think is really kind of related in that it's really important for our stakeholders to have a holistic perspective, right? And, and to consider the bigger picture. Um, and while doing user research may take more time initially, it will save us time and costly mistakes and rework down the road. So it's really an investment that ensures we're building something that truly resonates with the people that we're designing for. Um, lots of you know different uh, words or descriptions can go into why this is important. But I always think it's best to understand, um, put your research hat on and find out what is preventing your stakeholder from buying in. And, and, and those points are valid, whatever it is, it's valid. But once you understand um, the roadblock, then you'll be in a better position to educate and inform them. Um, so hopefully they will be an active participant um, and provide you with the input that you need to um, make sure you're um, focused on the right topics in the right ways, you know, with the right timelines and the right confidence levels and things like that. Thank so, you. Yeah. Um, all right. So along those lines, uh, you mentioned, you know, having that research, having them understand that big picture that in the grand scheme of things, we will save time, money, and effort down the road, right? And I think in order to get them to, to see that, we also have to be able to um, take those insights and that data to make a case for, for everything we do. So can you tell us a little bit of how we can take the data from our, and, and turn it into insights that, that become actionable steps that stakeholders can buy into and, and support and champion? Yeah, so I think it's really ties back to that initial step, like the research planning process should really be collaborative. Um, we really want to understand, you know, those core questions up front, you know, why do you want to know the answer to this question set like that? Why is really critical. And then how will the learnings be applied? And by understanding those two responses very clearly, not just from one stakeholder, but from your core stakeholders, those mm -hmm. conversations should unveil the priorities. Those conversations should um, uh, allow you to tie the question set to the business goals and objectives and create a clear line between how the research will inform whatever decisions need to be made by that time. Um, I have a uh, stakeholder kickoff document that I share quite a bit and I can get you guys a link to that. And I'll put that in the chat 
And this document is intended to help you uncover exactly these types of questions. So I just put that in the chat. And you'll see here that it is um, organized um, into different sections and different topics. So there is a section on background questions, and then there's a section on success in terms of what will make this study successful. And then there's a section also on collaboration and support. So we want to understand all of those facets. And in your first stakeholder meeting, I would really focus on the questions that are in bold. So for instance, how does this research tie into the broader organization's goals? What, if anything, do we already know about the research topic or target audience in regards to the topic? How do we know this? How confident are we in our knowledge about this? Um, and it is, is there any research or design or any work in flight that would be helpful for us to be aware of? that relates to the topic. So we wanna ask those questions not only to get closer to what we're actually looking to learn, but we also wanna make sure we're minimizing um, any sort of rework. Um, in terms of success, how will the learnings be applied is a really, really critical question. And if there is no idea or no clear answer, then perhaps we're not ready to do the study yet. Um, are we going out on a fishing expedition? Are we going out to um, validate that one design is better for another so we know which one to implement? Um, are we looking at, you know, taxonomy or nomenclature? You know, how will the learnings be applied is really, really critical. And it's also really critical to right size the time frame and the effort of the study. So we know that we're gathering the feedback in, in, in time in order to make that impact. Um, Confidence is another, you know, really important question. Uh, are we doing iterative research where we're, you know, conducting a series of studies over a period of time, say, we're moving from generative to initial concept to concept refinement to something that is a little bit more mid fidelity to high fidelity, and then to launch, you know, that's going to, you know, have a different approach and different sort of confidence um, uh, uh, methodology or calculation, if you will, than if we only have time to do one study. And if that one study is a really big study with multiple phases, or if it's one, you know, short and, you know, more gorilla type study. And there's a ton of other questions in there too, to help you get started and, and navigate those beginning conversations. Thank you, Michelle. We're getting some um, questions in the chat. So, um, so, uh, if you like to unmute yourself and ask your question out loud, please uh, feel free to do it now. Um, or Let's I can read go. Um, Kuhu has a great question about uh, what are some of the transitional skills from teaching that many teachers uh, may not think about that align with a UXR role? Um, and Kuhu, I'll let you um, maybe give us a little bit more context about your question. Like ever since I started UX um, this journey, I've heard that the transitional skills. Can you turn your volume up a, a little bit? It's it's difficult to hear you. Thank you right, so much. Is it better now? A little bit more. A little bit more. Okay, hold on. A lot of. All right. Is this better? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um. Since I've started this whole journey, um, I've heard that teachers have transitional skills, but there are certain skills I'm just wondering if I've not thought about them. Uh, like you mentioned improv earlier, which I'd never thought about before in terms of being a transitional skill for UXR, but I was just wondering if there's other skills that teachers may not think about that we have in our you know back pocket that we can bring up with recruiters and other people while we're thumb hunting or talking to yeah, tons, tons of skills. So, I mean, uh, communication skills, right? Teaching involves effectively conveying information to learners, right? And this skill translates directly to UX because you need to communicate your design ideas or your research learnings or your research approach. 
um, user needs, um, solutions, recommendations, considerations, things like that. Um, empathy. Um, also, you know, as a teacher, you need to understand the needs and emotions of your learners, which is vital, right? And it's also really vital to um, practicing um, UX at um, a proficient level. And it's crucial to creating those end solutions that, that meet those needs and create positive experiences. Um, I'd also add in problem solving, right? You're constantly, you know, teachers are constantly having to adjust their strategies to address diverse learning styles. Um, perhaps you have students that are more visual learners, and then you have students that are more um, storytelling learners or consumers of information. And then you have other types of students who learn best from an audio standpoint, right? And similarly, um, designers and UX and researchers also tackle complex problems. And a good portion of our job is seeking innovative solutions to enhance these experiences. Um, adaptability would be another one. Uh, flexibility, right? So teaching requires you to be adaptable to not only your physical environment, but your emotional environment as well as your tool stack. And um, student dynamics are very different. Um, in, from different age groups to different um, subject matter. Um, and similarly, uh, designers and researchers have to adapt to changing project requirements and competitive, um, the competitive landscape and um, unexpected feedback or roadmap changes. Um, evolving technologies would be another one. Um, you also have research skills, right? So teachers gather and analyze information um, I should write a post about this. This is very good inspiration. I'm going to write a post about this from the recording. So thank you. <laughs> this is where most of my posts come from and my newsletter articles come from the questions that people ask me. So thank you for answer, asking this question. Um, uh, research skills, right? You need to gather and analyze information, you to create lessons plans, to create like report cards and performance um, reports, you're analyzing and gathering information in UX as well on a, on a regular basis. Um, it also, also requires creativity and collaboration. I could go on and on and on and on and on. Is there anything in there that you would like to dive into? Presentation skills, time management, feedback integration, patience would be another one. Dealing with uncooperative. Oh, I feel like there are other teachers people. in the in the academy. They want to like sign in something because for me this is great because I'm working on my resume again and like I've been trying to sit here and I'm like, what skills do I have for my research resume? And this is just a great like list of things I wrote down. So I'm like, yeah, I've I've been doing these things. This is a good reminder for myself. It's a good pat on my back that I've done these things before. Oh, awesome, awesome. I'm glad it was helpful. It's a great question. Thank you. Great question. We have another really great question from Stephanie Chan. Stephanie, I don't know if you want to ask it or if you want me to read it from the chat. I will read it. Okay, Stephanie asks, how can I be sure that I'm recruiting the right people for user interviews for a new project? Can I use proto personas to help me with that? Um. So recruiting the right people is critical, right? You want to make sure that you're gathering the feedback from people who are best suited to provide it at that time. So if you're running a study on, say, um, the home buying process, you want to gather information from people who are currently in the process of buying a home. Now, your criteria may vary in terms of, you know, does this, what, price is this home? Is this like a, a low cost home? Let's just use some loose numbers. Is this a home um, that costs under $200,000? Or are we talking about um, people who are living outside of major cities and in rural areas? Is this a first time home buyer or a repeat home buyer? Is this a home buyer um, that is purchasing a, uh, a primary home or a vacation home? Is this um, buyer purchasing the, the home by themselves or with a partner? 
Um, are they taking out a loan? If so, what type of loan? Is it a traditional loan or is it a more modern loan? Or are they buying it all in cash? Um, so you want to really think through the criteria um, for the people best suited to provide it. That's my first step. And this is a very active dialogue with my stakeholders too. And coming up with a list of the must have criteria and then a list of the nice to have criteria. And in addition, a list of the criteria that you're willing to relax established up front so that while you're in the recruiting phase, if you see it's going to be a difficult recruit, don't have to go back to your stakeholders midway in the rush to find out what can be uh, relaxed so you can keep moving forward with your recruiting process. So recruiting is a two-way street. You want to screen in the right people and you want to screen out the wrong people. Another great approach is to develop a participant pool that you're constantly feeding over time. So you have a pool of warm bodies, so to speak, that you can draw from at a moment's notice. Um, when I create participant pools, I'm updating the survey screeners as I move through the roadmap to anticipate the criteria of the people that I'm going to need next. So I'm constantly feeding that pool with the type of people and whether we're recruiting for specific behaviors or specific attitudes or both so that they are right there, right? Right there when we need them, we have access to them easily. Thank you, Michelle. Along those lines of recruitment, um, you know, I think in an ideal world, we can recruit folks or when we have the, all the tools to do it. But when it comes to perhaps smaller companies that, you know, there's either a few designers and they have to wear like the designer and the researcher role and, and or, or their budget maybe is more limited, like how are some methods that you suggest for these people that have to wear multiple hats or, or have more limited resources when it comes to uh, search in a company that's smaller or perhaps less mature when it comes to UX and UX research? Mm -hmm. um, I think talking to your sales team is always a mm -hmm. great avenue to tap your, describe the type of people that you're looking to talk to and ask your sales team for recommendations. Um, also talk to your customer support team. Um, uh, people who called in for uh, help uh, will be able to identify people that uh, weren't able to complete that loan application and, and needed support. Yeah, uh, my learning platform for the Ask Like a Pro series is called Kajabi. And I just sent them a support ticket yesterday asking how I can change something on the landing page because it doesn't show up where all the other pages are in my online um, learning platform. So if we were running a study or if Kajabi was running a study, um, about um, people who are having difficulty editing changes in their portal, right? Support would be able to pull up my ticket, my Jira ticket or my Zendesk ticket or whatever you know they use and provide them with a list of names. And they could go as far as to say, people who've contacted support in the last seven days that live in um, the Western hemisphere of the United States and have had um, uh, classes on the portal for more than four years and have at least six active products or something like that. Um, your data analytics team uh, is also a really, really great source of data. No pun intended there, right? If you're looking for people that dropped off in the flow, like before X point or Y point, they can tell you if they're tracking it now um, who those people were, or what percentage of people, or how long um, someone spends on A page versus B page. Um, they can also commonly track FAQs and search terms, um, finding out which what are your top 100 search terms on your website is a great way to inform maybe what navigation um, isn't working as well as it should, or maybe where you have opportunities to clarify um, findability of some sort of detail. So I would say your sales team, your customer support team, and your data analytics team were great places to start. 
Wonderful. Thank you. So yeah, really tapping into what already exists. Uh, sales folks or customer care folks, uh, data analytics. Uh, that, that was a selfish question. So now I know my next steps. <laughs> um, wonderful. Uh, we are getting some questions in the chat, particularly, I think, around, um, well, one around mistakes. So um, switching gears into that lane, could you tell us about some common mistakes that you're seeing UX teams do when they're conducting research and when they are and or they're interpreting this result, the research that they're uh, synthesizing? Yeah, so I there's a there's there th learning how to become proficient as a user researcher is akin to learning a new language or learning how to play a, a musical instrument. It takes time, right? And it takes hands-on practice in a variety of situations, studies, recruits, um, methodologies to become um to become really good. I mean, it's just just like learning a new language. If you were going to learn Russian, right? You couldn't just read 12 articles on it or watch six YouTube videos or even binge articles for a year and watch YouTube videos for a year, right? You have to get out there and practice. You have to speak with someone to um, understand your own comprehension level and where you run into challenges um, and opportunities. So it's like, it's the practice is really important. Um, in the Ask Like a Pro series, that's what it's built on. It's built on marrying the theory with the practice where we conduct hands-on research. I'd say another um, challenge is not realizing the importance of the research plan. Um, the research plan is the spinal cord of your entire study. If you don't have time to write a plan and your stakeholders don't have time to provide you with very detailed feedback on an iterative plan, then you probably shouldn't be doing a study at all. Your research plan establishes the goalpost. Your research plan clarifies how your research question set supports key business objectives why you're looking to learn about the study and how the learnings will be applied, right? It also clarifies the timeline to ensure that the learnings will be realized in time to make informed product decisions. I'd say another um, challenge that I see, we already talked about recruiting, right? The importance of gathering feedback from the right people at the right time, right? And it's two-way street. You're screening in and you're screaming out. It's not screaming, screening out. Um, another is focusing on uh, platforms over methodology, right? So I have people say like, oh yeah, I'm I'm super proficient at, at maze or user testing or creating surveys or whatever. And the, the, the problem with focusing on a tool like that or, or like those um, first uh, before mastering how to actually ask good questions consistently in a live environment like this in an interview type um, conversation is that you will always default to the to the platform that you learned first or the methodology that you learned first. And you won't know the difference because you'll try to squeeze everything into the methodology. It's just like, if you, if you, you know, if your first laptop was a Mac, you're probably always going to be a Mac lover. If your first laptop, you know, was a PC, you're probably always going to default to a PC. It's just, it's just how we're, we're wired. Right. Um, but the fundamentals are, you'll build the fundamentals by learning how to ask good questions and gather reliable feedback consistently in a culturally relevant manner by mastering how to conduct an interview. You'll build your improv skills faster and quicker. And once you know how to gather that information in a live interview, you'll be able to apply it to any tool or any platform and be in a much better position to choose the right tool or platform when you need to. That was another really good post. <laughs> Ooh, that's great. I'm not, a, I'm not a researcher, but that's the first time I've ever thought about having a research plan that, that goes to show 
um, how much I have to learn about all of this. Um, I'll kick yeah. it back to Catalina. Thanks. Yeah, no, and I go on Rachel said, some of us are screaming in that, yeah, I think initially when I started, I was like, I can maze, I can do all these tools. And I was certainly lacking some knowledge. So working on that now. Um, I like to also tie, I think this question from Terry Holland ties in, in that her question is, is it best research from a general viewpoint? So I'm assuming kind of like the high, the thousand foot perspective or from as, or to get to start as specific as possible. Um, Terry, if you'd like to add on or build on your question, please uh, feel free to unmute yourself. Oh, yes. Um, right now I, um, <clears throat> I'm in web design right now as a freelancer, and I'm transitioning over into UX design right now. Uh, right now, I'm in uh, a boot camp through Springboard, and um, I'm right at the part um, in my capstone that I'm um, about to start the interview process, and I am writing my research plan as well, so I'm glad that was brought up. Um, and it's about... Um, just education and equity, especially in the black community. So I really want to help black children um, uh, just, you know, have more access and more options to education and, and that can help them be successful uh, as they go through middle and high school and, and hopefully um, into secondary education. But uh, yeah, I, as I'm like trying to figure out who I want to interview, of course, I'm like thinking about teachers and and, and, and programs, I'm, I'm just like a little, I feel like I'm kind of all over the place and I'm trying to find some focus and I don't know if I should start as like general as possible or to try to get as specific as possible for the problem I'm trying to solve. Well, my first question to you is gonna be very similar to what we just talked about. What are you looking to learn and how will the learnings be applied? And we can walk through this and kind of um, you know, talk it through if that would be helpful. Yeah, Michelle, you said, what are the learnings? Yeah. Oh, you said what I'm looking to learn and how will the learnings be applied? And how will they be applied? Um, right now, I'm looking to learn what the gaps are um, as far as like, okay, maybe I need to actually Think about that more so i probably should like um so i'm gonna i need to probably definitely uh get more specific in that but I'm, I, I guess like just generally trying to find the gaps um in the in the education system uh right now um usually like i know someone else said they work in early childhood development um from kindergarten to second grade i believe the person said uh earlier um so yeah definitely i'm focusing on children in that age range and like what's missing and 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 how i know literacy is a big thing um at that age and just finding out how to help with that um to get black children on um on track so they don't get derailed early on okay so this let's i so just really narrowing this down, right? So gaps on the education system um, that pertain to literacy and specifically for um, black and brown children ages, um, I'll make this up like five to eight or something like that, right? So then let's narrow it down even further. Are we talking about children who may be prone to dyslexia, children who have dyslexic parents? Uh, are we talking about children who are in public schools, children who are in parochial schools, children who are in after school programs, like let's really narrow it down. Are we talking about children that live in urban areas, children that live in rural areas? Like let's ratchet it down because what you'll do from here is create segments of participants to gather feedback from. So maybe you have one segment that is, um, rural and then you have one segment that is urban um, each includes a age range of five to eight year olds um, in low income housing right but in terms of the gaps now let's focus on that question right every every word in your research question should be 
like written down and then analyzed for whether there could be a subjective interpretation of that. So a gap might be an attitudinal gap. It might be a behavioral gap. It might be a nutritional gap. It might be a um, knowledge gap. It might be a gap in parenting, right? So what do we mean by gaps, right? And then what do we mean by educational? Are we talking about education just during school? Are we talking about education um, in after school programs? Are we talking about like, how are we defining education? And then how are we defining system? Let me pause there. Yes, no, I, I yes, I, <laughs> I have a lot of specifics that I need to work on, but thank you so much. This helps a ton to get me focused because um, yeah, I do want to get as, yeah, I guess, getting as narrow. So I guess getting as specific as possible is ideal for my research. Well, yeah. And then, and then don't forget the whole, you know, second part of them. That that's first question is just, what do we want? You know, why do we want to learn? What are we trying to learn? Right. And then the second part is how will the learnings be applied? So will the learnings be implied to inform better education for parenting? Will the learnings be applied to inform um, early prevention uh, and uh, dyslexia testing? Will the learnings be applied to um, an app for caregivers to manage progress and homework completion? I mean, Clearly. Yeah. Um, right. Yeah. I, I definitely was more thinking of a, I guess, um, I like a, a supplementary program. Um, and I do want to, as far as like apps, I feel like tracking children um, and their progress as well. Um, so they don't fall through the cracks. Um, but I, I still need to figure out. Um, yeah. Just specifically where are these children and what, uh, issues am I specifically trying to address with it? So, yeah. So um, we want to like really narrow it down and then come up with some hypotheses that you can then test, right? So your hypothesis is that, um, totally making this up, right? Um, look, my daughter's dyslexic. So I'm going to use this as a as an example, um, before she was diagnosed, I really didn't know any more about dyslexia than, than the common person. Um, her kindergarten teacher um, uh, identified that there was a significant gap in her comprehension, her ability to comprehend something orally versus the written word. She had, um, and still has a terrific vocabulary um, and she's very, very quick on her feet. But when it came to processing written words on the page, there was a gap in that knowledge base compared to the other areas in which she was able to communicate, collaborate, um, pick up concepts, explain her thoughts or her feelings, et cetera. So is the hypothesis around that, right? Is the hypothesis around the connection between um, uh, teachers noticing gaps in early childhood education and getting them tested sooner is the hypothesis around if we if our children um, eat better, you know, then they will be able to retain more information and that will increase literacy scores. So, like, what's the hypothesis or um, assumption, what are the assumptions that we're going into this study looking to either prove or disprove? We need to have that point of view and that point of view to tie this back to the beginning, right? Should have been discussed with our stakeholders at the onset of the project. Yeah. Thank you, Michelle. And thank you, Carrie, for engaging um, back and forth. Uh, just being a little mindful of time. I know we have some unanswered questions in the chat. Um, so we might not get to all of them, but uh, at least before uh, we have to wrap up, we want to ask you, you know, if there were like some 
like the methods that we should master first as we either have already embarked on our UX research uh, uh, journey or not, like that we should master. So like top methods that this is what you need to nail down first in order to set yourself up for success. I'm gonna share a link to my Ask Like a Pro series. And what you'll see here are a series of six workshops. And each workshop breaks down the core components that I believe you need to know to become a proficient user researcher. And it all starts with planning, right? The workshops follow the same approach that we um, use to conduct user research in the wild. Um, it starts with planning, survey screening, then interviewing, right? We need to learn how to ask questions and gather meaningful, relevant information consistently in a live environment before we focus on tools or platforms or anything fancy. And then we continue through the rest of the process. But I share that link um, uh, because we're offering ladies that UX a 10% discount on our observer and on-demand seats in our next cohort. But more importantly, because it breaks down what I think is the most important components to master in each step of the process and why. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, we are, yep, Rachel just sent the uh, you can use to get uh, that 10% off of Michelle's workshop. Um, thank you again very much for doing this session, Michelle. Um, if you'd like to learn more about Michelle or Curiosity Tech or just generally about uh, UX research, please do sign up for her newsletter. Um, I'll shout out the, uh, oh, Rachel just did <laughs> the link to sign up for it. And um, with that, thanks, Rachel. I'll pass it on to you for uh, any closing uh, thoughts or other further announcements. Uh, yeah, thank you. So um, yeah, so we did uh, um, put the discount in the chat. And uh, for anyone who, I don't know, I'll just read it out loud. It's just ladies that UX minus 10%. That's the discount. Um, and uh, Michelle has a lot of uh, great workshops um, to check out and uh, great information on Curiosity Tank. Um, and then also uh, besides tonight, this AMA that we had and i um, very grateful for Michelle's time. Uh, Michelle's gonna be featured on the Ladies That UX podcast. Michelle, do you know the release date for that? Is that in September sometime? It is. It is slated for the first week in September. I'm going to repost um, the link to the resources doc um, as well. Um, I don't have a final release date. I should actually follow up with them. It was, we recorded it in June. They um, are European, so they've been on vacation for 180 days. That's so probably so, why I don't have yeah. an update. Those lucky Europeans. Yeah, they'll be they'll be um, back, um, you know, mid September or something, or maybe sooner. Um, but I did post the Spotify link to the Ladies at UX podcast, which has um, like all the past episodes. So just keep your eye on that or subscribe, and then you will get uh, the fresh drop of Michelle's podcast when it comes out. Um, so I just want to thank you um, again. This is a wrap on this Ladies That UX DC event. And I want to thank everyone for joining us and dealing with our um, some technical difficulties. And um, and our first AMA ever, by the way, we've never done this before, Michelle. So you're, you're breaking, you know, groundbreaking uh, everywhere. And um, yeah, thank you so much to everyone and make sure you check out curiositytank.com for more information about Michelle and everything that Curiosity Tank has to offer and make sure you use that, take advantage of that 10% discount. Thanks everyone. And feel free to reach out if you have um, additional questions. I'm really passionate about user research and um, not only practicing it, I'm in the middle of a study right now, um, but in teaching others how to become more proficient um, 
in asking better questions and making better decisions. Thanks for having me. Thank you again, Michelle. Thanks, everyone. Have a great rest of your evening.